Michael Lamb, so nice to see you. Thank you for joining me. You are Excel's Senior Vice President of Distribution and Gas, and we're talking all things uh, advanced metering infrastructure, smart meters, and, and AMI 2.0 today. So thanks for being here. My pleasure. It's an exciting topic. I'm looking forward to the conversation. It is really exciting, and we'll get to a couple of things. Those that I just listed, but also this achievement by Excel and iTron to deploy 2 million smart meters. And that in and of itself is an achievement because deploying anything is hard, especially at that scale. But I'm really interested in unpacking a little bit of the life cycle of that project, of making the business case, going down this road of smart meters, um, picking that vendor and, and getting it out to customers ultimately, and then what you're learning from that deployment. So, so maybe we can start there. Where did Excel's smart metering journey begin and, and how did you first approach this even before getting down the road of a, you know, having conversations with folks like those at iTron? Well, I could take you way back a couple of decades when we were one of the early adopters of AMR, uh, a CellNet technology that we put in place uh, in the mid to late 90s. Uh, into the early 2000s, but I won't dwell on 20 years ago or 25 years ago. Uh, we came to the place where the business case, when you create a business case, it's all about the customer. It's how they benefit. Um, so when we looked at the business case from a customer perspective, there was a great deal of benefits, a great deal of value that smart meters, modern day smart meters would create. And fundamentally, uh, it came in a couple of uh, key categories. Uh, one is information that would be at, that would be available to customers, uh, energy use at time of day, um, all kinds of things that as as our customers become more mature and smarter energy users, like everybody's customers are becoming, um, that kind of information will, will create a lot of value. The second be, the second big component is just from a from an operational perspective minimizing outages, understanding where an event occurs and responding to that outage sooner rather than later. Smart meters allows us to do that. So it it shortens and reduces, it shortens outages for customers and reduces the number that they have. And then finally, we're all energy users and we're all, we all care about cost. Uh, smart meters also allows us to keep costs low. Um, it, it automates uh, the the reading of meters, which were previously done in a manual way, depending on the technology a particular utility had. So when you walk through all of those components, again, from a customer perspective, the business case made a lot of sense. So having made that transition from, you mentioned AMR, and you've been through the AMI 1.0 days and now into AMI 2.0, and, and there's a lot of discourse around whether AMI 2.0 even living up to the hype of what we would like it to do based on the expectations and the need of an evolving energy society. I think of AMI you know, as an arm of communications being a lot like the private LTE conversation that I've had with some others in different groups at Excel of, we know what we need it for now and we think we know what we'll need it for tomorrow, but tomorrow's tomorrow, it, there, there could be so many different use cases that we don't even know about. Has it been a similar journey with AMI and, and maybe frame a little bit too about that state of the technology? Has it has it lived up to what we what what we need it to be? I think, John, it's fair to say that we're still in progress, right? Um, so we're we're two million in, and we got another million and a half ish to go. So we're still in early days. But from where I sit, it absolutely has lived up to the basics of that business case I talked about. Um, it is uh, absolutely proving to be beneficial in those three areas that I just highlighted. Um, and then you, you have a great point. Uh, we don't know what tomorrow will bring. I mean, we can envision, we can anticipate, and we certainly do that at Excel Energy. Um, I think it will just, the business case will continue to grow in value as that, that future world is better understood. Um, no doubt. There's no doubt in my mind, actually, that that will occur. Let's jump back into that journey of, you know, selecting a vendor and going through deployment. Um, what, what was the most difficult piece of that that life cycle in in getting these meters out to the field and installed and and then getting to that stage of learnings and and data um, were there any hiccups along the way that you guys came across well absolutely I mean I you you said it early on in this discussion um, anytime you're 
installing millions of anything, you're going to come up with hiccups, right? Especially when it's... Uh, it was a loaded hot. question, Michael. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think uh, I think the, the before the deployment stage, I, I wouldn't highlight any big hiccups. Um, the business case made a lot of sense, against, again, from a customer perspective. You know, there were some regulatory challenges, but I wouldn't highlight any as major, uh, just sort of working through the process. Um, I think the biggest hiccup was actually supply chain issues uh, in a, actually getting meters with the right chips installed. Um, and some of that's COVID related. And we're certainly not the only industry to experience chip issues. Um, I think that was the biggest uh, logistical challenge we faced um, and slowed us down, quite frankly, uh, to some extent. You mentioned mentioned the the policy and regulatory side, and you don't have to speak to what other utilities are going to, but just for the the listener and viewer, um, you know, Eversource is having some challenges in getting their case made to um, their own regulators to to um, to cover the cost of advanced metering deployment. What 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 is the biggest challenge there when it comes to the policy framework and, and showing your regulators that this truly will benefit both our operations and the the customer experience for the better and and any maybe lessons learned just from from your own experience on you know maybe we would have done this differently yeah i think uh, i think i risk oversimplifying in my answer uh a bit uh but i i think if if you just think of the basics of a regulator what is the cost impact what is the reliability impact um and then they there's this third component that you know not all customers will want this. So how do I deal with those customers who don't want it? Or maybe it's stakeholders that don't want it. Um, so you got to deal with that as well. Um, and then the fourth thing, and I'll end with this really in terms of this particular question is, how do you quantify and tell the story about the added value that AMI will bring? The reliability benefit, the additional information that customer gets because an AMI exists. That sometimes is a difficult story to tell, so it lands. So I guess as a lesson learned, I'd, I'd, I'd focus more on that, that storytelling, if you will, highlighting the benefits that are not necessarily intuitively obvious. That's a really good point. And actually a story I'm, I'm kicking around uh, for the future is just how you know regulatory bodies seem to be getting much more particular about um, investment requests and grid modernization efforts and are saying, if you can't tell that story, you're not getting the money. And it's becoming um, more and more incumbent on utilities to demonstrate that very clearly of here's how we will move the needle in one way or the other. So I, I appreciate that context. Let's let's get back to your own deployment, though. In selecting this device, particularly with ITRON, what, what went into figuring out what was best for your needs and and how did you go through that process? Well, I think in short, it was a fairly traditional sourcing process where we didn't focus on the technology. We focused on the capabilities the product would enable. Um, and, and we placed a value on those capabilities. And then, of course, you go through the traditional work of an RFP where you evaluate total cost and uh, structure of the company and their their ability to be a good partner and the logistical challenges that may may or may not exist with them uh, and and you 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 uh, you let organizations bid on the request and then you evaluate the bids against quite literally a couple of hundred different pieces of criteria that we identified and and out comes the the winner so. It, it was a, it wasn't a challenge. It was just a traditional sourcing event that took a number of months. I'm not saying it was easy, uh, but it, there wasn't anything surprising about it, John. It was just simply doing the due diligence that gave us the best answer for our customers and our states. I'm going to dub over your voice and say the deal was done at Distributech International, our event, and then I'll be able to use that in all our marketing materials now. Okay. I'm only kidding. Um, <laughs> Okay, excellent. So now you got 2 million of these out in the field. You'll have 3.5 when it's all said and done, or maybe more. The value of that data is it's it's just gold. So you're getting hundreds of millions of data points. What are you learning already um, from those devices and how you manage the system and engage with customers? And what maybe excites you most about 
this um, this optionality that you now have in serving them? Well, I, I, I said this a few a few minutes ago, but I think the data is telling us our business case was spot on. So we are already seeing uh, outage response and outage identification benefits. Um, we are also already seeing uh, behavior change. Uh, when customers have more information, uh, they their behavior will change. Now, obviously, that's a broad, I'm painting customers with a broad brush there, not everyone. Um, and one thing that's really important uh, with respect to customer behavior is giving them the tools that are easy to use so that they can visualize how their energy is being used. That will drive behavior change as compared to just a whole bunch of data tables stating the obvious. So um, that excites me. It excites me that our business case as we envisioned it is panning out. Um, and then if I think, and if I dream just a little and think about the future and go beyond the business case, um, I am very excited about how the data and the connection with our customers can truly help Excel Energy achieve our industry leading carbon free objectives. Um, when you think of the future and a carbon free environment uh, where we're significantly reliant on variable energy resources, mother nature driven energy resources. Um, and you, you, you complement that with an EV penetration rate of 20 to 30 to plus percent. Think of those as controllable load or storage devices um, or other distributed energy resources. Smart meters play a critical role in uh, helping balance that energy ecosystem. Um, I'm super excited for that and really think of smart meters as a fundamental building block to enable us to do that. So what's next then? What's that next frontier that you're looking out to of maybe in 10 years we'll be able to do this? Um, we can't do it now, but if we have this infrastructure in place, whether it's through you know card upgrades or whatever, um, we, we might get there in terms of the visibility behind the meter, um, better communication visibility in front of the meter with with the associated um, infrastructure that links to the, the distribution grid. I think that's one of the really exciting pieces that is still out there for someone to solve for is really having uh, having true and reliable visibility into all parts of our our deployed infrastructure. Yeah, great question. And I, I think I, I sort of touched on some of that, but I'll elaborate just a little bit. And, and I love how you separated it, you know, behind the meter or in front of the meter, right? So let me let me attack it both ways. But let me say that this is all about bringing value to our customers. I mean, if we're not driving value so that they see value for the for the price, we're failing. So this is really about um, enabling them to be better, smarter energy consumers. So let me just talk about behind the meter for a second on a customer premise. You know, I can envision a time and this doesn't, I don't really have to imagine it. It exists if you have the right tools today, but where you are automated as a consumer of energy, you are, you have fully automated how you use that energy time of day, what appliances get used, what appliances don't get used against not only carbon environmental signals, but also price signals. I think that's just going to continue to grow and mature and evolve. Um, when I think of in front of the meter, it's it's really uh, realizing the dream of a self-healing grid in a much more meaningful way than we have in the past. So with a whole bunch of new infrastructure that doesn't exist today, automated switches, automated fuses, um, automated reclosers, a whole lot of more smarts on the distribution grid. The AMI, the smart meter, is a critical part in helping us automate and drive operations of all that new infrastructure so the grid truly is self-healing. Instead, instead of an outage impacting 100 customers, because we have all of this information, it can only it, maybe it only impacts 10 customers. And we resolve it sooner rather than later. And one thing I didn't touch on that crosses the bridge of before and after the meter are EVs. Um, I think they're a game changer, um, especially if the forecasts come true. And I have no reason to believe that they won't. Um, but if you just think of an EV as um, a battery or a controllable load, that's a powerful thing in the context of, you know, an 80% plus penetration rate of renewable energy. 
Yeah, and it's hard when you're often in the dark for who's adopting that technology to to plan upgrades or to meet their needs when yeah. out of nowhere that feeder is just uh, you know nearly at capacity. So, um, and, and that I, I really liked how you gave me that context because it's my understanding that we're getting really really smart at the grid edge and we're pretty smart at the beginning of the line too. But there's really a a messy middle in terms of communication and knowing how our assets are are performing and, and what they're doing in real time. Is that a fair framing of, you know, sort of how the distribution grid is is set up today? Yeah, it is. And I and I think one of our challenges, John, is um it, consumers really haven't had a reason to care about what the distribution grid looks like. I mean, uh, but now we we sort of need to uh because of the changes. Um so understanding the journey of how a distribution system be, was designed and be, and came to be, minimal visibility, minimal control, because there was no reason to have it, to a time in the future where maximum visibility, maximum control, that's a transformational journey that we're all progressing down. Michael Lamb, thanks so much for joining me today. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, I agree, John. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the, con- the conversation. Love talking about this. Love geeking out about the grid. <laughs>